It's time again for Talking Trade, sponsored by MMAC's World Trade Association and Michael Best Strategies. Welcome to another session of Talking Trade. I'm Ken Waslick, Managing Director of EM Waslick & Associates, a international business development company. And I'm Sandy Siegel, President of MEJ. A very warm welcome today to Ian Coxhead, an economist, Professor Emeritus from UW-Madison, um, where he served for 32 years up until last year, and is now a Senior Research Fellow at the Institute of Developing Economies, which is a public sector in, uh, research institute engaged in economic, social, and political studies of emerging Asian economies, and currently um, located in Tokyo and working from Tokyo. So, um, you know, a warm welcome um, to you in Tokyo, and most notably um, of your of your resume is uh, the post of uh, the previous host of Talking Trade. So I'm um, really I was hoping really, you would say that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so it's just so great to have you back um, on Talking Trade and and collaborate as we have over the years. Um, you know, with your great um, experience and and now with a new perspective on on what's going on in Asia. So exciting to talk about that, Ian. And, um, you know, in particular, let's start with what's going on in the Chinese economy. Um, that's certainly in the news quite a bit now. Um, the last couple of years, we've seen, you know, the impacts of COVID, of the increased, you know, demand, um, supply chain crisis and, and, and challenges catching up with that, continued challenges with the Section 232 and, you know, 301 duties and, and the Trump trade wars. So where are we today? Give, give, you know, give us an overview of the perspective and, and the climate, um, you know, from Asia's perspective. Well, hi, Sandy, and hi, Ken, and thank you both very much for uh, getting me back on the show. I do like the idea that I'm a talking trade uh, host emeritus. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Ian, I was going to thank you for, you know, moving to Tokyo. So it gave me the opportunity <laughs> to work with Sid. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, uh, Ken, don't don't get the, don't let that seat get too comfortable. I might come. Back. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, you guys know that I'm not. You you guys know that I'm an Asia expert, but not a, by any means a China expert. However, uh, in order to understand the, the other emerging economies, well, the mature and emerging economies of Asia, uh, these days, it's impossible not to spend a lot of time thinking about China, because of course, China is right in the middle of the Asian regional economy. And so anything that happens in China has an impact on the rest of the region. And that's really the primary focus of my study. And I'm going to, uh, of my work, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, if you give me a chance later on uh, in this in this interview. So, you know, the background, I think, is pretty familiar. You know, the open door policy in China starting from the very late 1970s was based on relaxing constraints to market operation, huge increases in efficiency and resource mobilization, but a very low tech economy, uh, lots and lots of economic growth in China during that period. And its Asian neighbors uh, plugged the gaps in the Chinese economy. So they got their high tech uh, inputs from Northeast Asia. They got their medium tech inputs from Southeast Asia, countries like uh, Singapore, Thailand, and Malaysia. And of course, they got their raw materials, their resources from Indonesia and other countries as well. And that all generated not only a lot of growth in China, but also a lot of spillover growth to the rest of the Asian regional economy, as we all as we all know. And of course, you know, China was uh, saving a lot of the uh, growth returns and turning that into new financial capital, new human capital investments and know-how. And all of that began to pay off in the 2000s as well. But then a uh, big, big shift that is not really that uh, obvious to a lot of people, starting about 2006 with a, with a very explicit shift on the part of China uh, away from kind of market opening towards industrial promotion policies uh, aimed at creating a high-tech economy, aimed ultimately at reducing China's uh, dependence on the rest of the region and indeed the rest of the world for uh, for manufacturers in general, high-tech uh, goods in particular, and the Made in China policy that started in 2015 is the uh, the current incarnation 
uh, of that kind of thinking. And, you know, together those phenomena have caused what I call uh, a, an inversion in the domestic value added of uh, China's exports. That is the contribution of um, uh, China's own inputs uh, to the value of its exports to the rest of the world. Uh, as countries globalize, usually that content goes down uh, because they are specializing and then they're buying uh, their specialized inputs from other countries and turning them into final goods at home. But in the case of China, since about 2010, it's gone the other way. And the Chinese uh, component of China's final goods exported to the rest of the world has been rising very steadily during that time. And that change, of course, is in the background of concerns about the effects on other countries' development prospects. And, of course, it's in the background of trade tensions uh, that have led to higher barriers on China's exports to the rest of the world from the US and the EU. So then before the global financial crisis, China was doing great with all of these policies and efficiency gains. Uh, since about 2010, a lot less growth. And this year, much, much less growth in the Chinese economy. And now, of course, as we are, everyone knows, they're suffering from slow growth, aging population, shrinking labor force, financial instability. Uh, all of these things are not the product of the Trump trade wars and the terrible Chinese response to COVID-19, but they have been exacerbated by those as well. Uh, Chinese households, they're getting scared. Their savings are tied up in real assets like real estate and stuff like that. Uh, so they're really unwilling to spend at the moment. Uh, skilled labor is still in scarce supply in spite of a lot of investment in that area. Um, and grandiose uh, state initiatives like the Belt and Road Initiative have been very costly with very little payoff to the Chinese economy. So right now, there's just a ton of noise in the system and lots of speculation that China's miracle growth years are, in fact, behind it. Yeah. So, uh, Ian, you, you mentioned um, you know, the um, relationship between China and the EU. We're setting up trade barriers from the uh, U.S. and also from uh, Europe. And, and you mentioned that, you know, China is basically the big gorilla in Asia and affects the entire Asian economy and all the other um, economies that are neighbors. So what is the effect on their neighbors uh, in, let's say, India or Vietnam or Korea? What's the effect of Japan on the current Chinese situation or economic uh, condition with all their East Asia nations? Yeah, so, you know, this, uh, this kind of inversion of uh, domestic value added that I was talking <clears throat> about uh, has means that countries that uh, have really uh, built their economies around being part of a global supply chain that goes through China, uh, finding different kinds of outcomes associated with that. So as China uh, domesticates its own manufacturing value chain, then uh, middle income countries that used to supply it with parts and components, electronic components, electrical goods, that kind of thing, are finding that their market uh, in China, at least for those goods, has now diminished very greatly. And this is kind of no, the worst case scenario here is that it's sort of kicking away the ladder to industrial uh, development in those other middle income countries because their biggest market, the one that they really oriented themselves towards, has uh, now much uh, slower growth in demand for those products. And conversely, of course, what China now wants from a lot of those countries is much more uh, labor intensive stuff or natural resource intensive stuff, uh, industries like tourism, for example, which will contribute to growth but not to uh, investments or high return investments in uh, medium high tech industries or indeed investments in educational capital. Interesting. Interesting, very interesting. Shift gears uh, maybe just a little bit um, and, and something I understand you're involved in now and in, in your work and your research and, and talk about um, some of the education focus in China. I understand um, there's uh, been a massive investment in education. Um, for China and especially college education, and tell us about that a little bit, and 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 what's that? What does that mean for China and and the rest of the economy? Yeah, thanks, Sandy. Well, of course, you know, with the one-child policy, suddenly there were a lot of resources in China and and households to invest in their uh, scarce children, and so the uh, tertiary enrollment rate for twenty-year-olds in China, which was three point four percent of the cohort in 1990 is now 40%, which is as high as any as the OECD average. Of course, China is uh, uh, no, nowhere near as rich as the typical OECD country. So it's pretty high. Um, 
uh, now, you know, skills uh, acquired through tertiary education are complementary with capital. So all of that helps with upgrading the skill content of the Chinese economy and the high tech uh, uh, goals that the Chinese government has set for the economy. Um, but of course, that also comes at the expense of suppliers in other countries, so that uh, countries like Thailand and Malaysia are increasingly finding that the demand for skills in their in their economies has retreated, or at least has grown much more slowly as a result of this kind of structural shift in the pattern of trade with China. And, you know, th that's not unique to Southeast Asia as well. Uh, Mexico, in closer relations with the US, is experiencing something very similar, that kids who uh, are not doing that well at school uh, can leave school at 15 and at 16 be working in a maquilladora in Mexico. Uh, that's a great job for a while, but it's a blue collar job and it's never going to lead to anything more. And sooner or later, as in China, they're going to get priced out of that market by rising wages. Meanwhile, of course, in China, you know, the slowing economy has reduced growth and demand for all workers, including the tertiary educated ones. Yeah. Uh, the government's been stomping on tech firms and the tutoring industry, and that hasn't helped. And now we've got uh, uh, urban educated youth unemployment hitting 21 percent in the middle of this year before the Chinese government curtailed data gathering on that particular thing. But shooting the messenger isn't going to change the facts on the ground. Uh, there are 360 million Chinese between the ages of 15, uh, sorry, 16 and 35. And, you know, they've got to be wondering what the future holds in terms of employment and income. Right. So yeah. less demand for, you know, labor, um, the labor force and yeah, and then nowhere for the more educated people to go as well. And so, yeah. Under the current policies, yeah. Right. And yeah. That's right. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, interesting. Has this benefited? Um, you know, we've been approached by several U.S. companies um, that have operations in China to find them other alternatives in Asia. You know, the China plus one from a sourcing mm -hmm. point or a decoupling, or how can I minimize or downsize my Chinese uh, plant and maybe move it to Vietnam or Malay uh, Philippines. Do you mm -hmm. see this as being a real benefit, the slowdown in China, a benefit uh, to the other uh, countries in the region? Oh, uh, undoubtedly, Ken, it's a benefit. And I think by we all know that the biggest beneficiary by far has been Vietnam, which was kind of historically just poised to you know, be a receptive uh, host for those kinds of investments and right. that's paid off hugely for them. In terms of blue collar jobs, I mean, what's moving out of, you know, for the most part, what's moving out of China, uh, 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 labor intensive assembly type industries uh, employing a lot of blue collar workers. China is now pricing itself out of that market by, uh, you know, slower labor force growth, very rapidly, uh, historically very rapidly rising wages. And those are industries which are pretty footloose. So they'll stick around in Vietnam or the Philippines for as long as it's profitable to be there. And then they'll find another host, mm -hmm. uh, whatever that host will be, India or further west, uh, as uh, wages in Vietnam also. Uh, price them out of that market. So, you know, it's good. It's good in the interim. It creates a lot of jobs in those countries. It's not obvious that it leads to sustained uh, technology intensive growth or indeed uh, even sustained employment growth beyond the uh, blue collar jobs directly involved. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Certainly, I, I know we're certainly seeing it and a shift from imports and sourcing and you know, but I've been doing this long enough to remember when China was one of our biggest um, resources of, of <laughs> you know, finished goods and so yeah. forth. So I've been doing this. Yeah, it's certainly um, some shifts in the economy. Um, Ian, we could Yeah, and Sandy, I, got, I, I guess I know, I know we're over time, but I just want to say, of course, you know, I've, I've painted a pretty grim picture of China, but it is still the world's second largest economy. And there's still a lot happening there, obviously. Right. So. Yes. Well, and as with our economy, a lot of moving parts and a lot of, you know, dynamics pulling, um, you know, pulling us in, in various directions and um, other global um, forces out there that we're all waiting to see how they impact all our economies. So uh, very interesting times. Well, thank you for the quick catch up um, on, on what's going on there. Our, our man on the ground in Asia, um, but no, I mean, it, you know, your insight and your economic background is always really insightful as to connecting the dots. Um, so really interesting chatting. Um, I look forward to having you back in. It was really great to see you again and to have you back on Talking Tree.
Thanks, Andy and Ken. It's really great to be back on the show, even if just for a few minutes. It's terrific. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Ian. You've been listening to Talking Trade, sponsored by MMAC's World Trade Association and Michael Best Strategies.